Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome to the second day, second workshop for ZapFest. Uh, we did one last week. I'm sure most of you were here. Uh, this is our second series in two. Uh, we'll be doing four, so two more to come after today. Uh, today we have a packed agenda. We'll start off with a very brief introduction to uh, Mobile Computing Research Center uh, by Victor Ball, and I'll introduce him shortly. Then we'll have this talk, which you'll find very interesting. It is creating an app and publishing it in 30 minutes. This would be Carlo, who will be speaking. Then finally, we'll have something called Mango, the Mango release, which is coming out soon, which is available internally. And you'll be playing around with it. And we'll tell you what uh, are the new things in there and what all cool things you can do with it. And Sean would be introducing Mango to you. I'll, I'll introduce Victor. Victor is the director of the Mobile Computing Research Center. He is, uh, his, to his credit, has some 200 granted patents. Uh, actually, he stopped counting after that, so it's probably much more than that. And uh, he's been active in the network research area for a long time. Uh, he heads the center, uh, about which today he'll, he'll tell us about. Victor. Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, let me ask a, a question. How many of you are not interns? Any, any non-interns? That's cool. No, who are not interns. That's cool. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, Ajman said, you know, I, I uh, do head up uh, a new center. It's called MCRC for short, or uh, Mobile Computing Research Center. Uh, before doing this, I was uh, uh, heading up uh, networking research. I've been in Microsoft for about 14 years, and before that I was in DAC for about nine years. So I've been in industry for a long time, in industry labs for a long time. Um, I've seen quite a bit, up and down. But I'm really excited about uh, what I'm doing now. This is sort of a new challenge uh, uh, for me personally and for the team itself as well. And, um, you know, I, as we look at the future, I, uh, I sort of think about, you know, there's there you will you can sort of see uh, there are several uh, sort of generations of things that happen. So Morgan Stanley had this great report which talked about sort of five generations uh, of computing cycles, and we are on the fifth one, and that is all about mobility. And so mobility is very pervasive and will become even more pervasive, uh, and uh, it's going to be part of our lives. It's going to be part of the billions of people who who are now going to adopt these phones. So. So if you're working in this area, or if you're sort of thinking about working in this area, you're doing the right thing. This is, this is where the action is going to be in, uh, in the uh, many, many years. And it'll have different forms, of course. I mean, you don't have to have, think about the phone as the way it is, but it could be anything, disaggregated computing, user mobility, systems mobility, and things like that. And um, so we get that. At Microsoft, you know, we've done uh, quite a remarkable job, I think, with the desktop, and one of the big things we did with is we took the computing um, and, and brought it to the masses. We made it made sure that everybody in, uh, who who could who wanted to have access to it had an access to it, and that's why more than 95 percent of the world's computers run Windows. Now, with the phone, we also had the right idea for many many years, as you remember. Um, when uh, you know Palm was there, and then Windows Phone was there, we did the right thing, and we we knew we had the vision. But we let it slip by. Uh, we, we, you know, we did very well, and then Apple came from nowhere, uh, sort of showed a sort of a new way. We became complacent, essentially, and uh, we were uh, fairly happy with our success in desktop, and we didn't pay as much attention to mobility. But things are different now, right? So we, we completely recognize that fact. Uh, we recognize that, you know, how the world is changing. So MCRC was sort of created uh, as part of MSR with lots of researchers uh, lots of PhDs who, are, who have been here working on different parts of mobility to come together along with a very strong engineering team uh, put together and with a very dedicated or focused mission. And the mission of, of the center is, in one line, is to invent technologies that make Microsoft devices and services indispensable to the world. If you uh, parse that, that statement, 
It says to invent technologies, so it has a component of research in there. It puts Microsoft in the center of the mission statement, so we're talking about Microsoft services and devices. It is not about just brain publications, which, is, which we are very good at, as, as many of you may know. And uh, talking about indispensable makes it very clear that we're not talking about incremental stuff here. We're talking about things that are going to be disruptive. Now, so as we think about these, these things, uh, we, you know, um, we sort of realize MCRC, my own uh, sort of uh, experiences and, and of that of my team has been that it's the next generation of, of you know, computing is going to be invented by many of you guys who are in universities now and studying. And so we've started, uh, we've already had massive engagement in other areas, but we've started this, this huge engagement that we have over uh, much more so than, than perhaps the Google of the world and the Apples of the world, uh, because we have been in the academic circle for a long time. And the engagement has resulted in uh, creating several programs. And Hawaii is one of those programs that, that you learn about here and you're going to program against. And this intern contest uh, that we are co-sponsoring with the Windows Phone organization is another one of that. And the idea is that the recognition that a lot of these ideas, these gems are going to come from you, we don't want you to reinvent the wheel all the time. And so we do our best to create the infrastructure piece that allows you to innovate. So, so when you come here and, and listen to these talks and figure out how to do it, it's to free your mind to be, be innovative. It's not about that you have to deal with every little thing. And Microsoft, uh, you know, the reason they became very successful is, uh, in the PC world is uh, was partly because we are very, very good at this. We are very good at creating a development uh, developer ecosystem which allows you to program very easily. And as we went out with the Hawaii program and, and touched almost 30 universities which are teaching courses around that, the constant feedback that we got from them was it was really easy to program using Windows phones. And our hope is that by doing these contests and giving you the sort of the training, we will expose you to that, uh, that, that sort of power, that, that ability to, to program these devices so well. And, and in the process, you will start to appreciate how much thought has gone into this whole thing. And speaking from Microsoft, you know, we are very much now completely focused on this. I mean, we are completely committed. We are all in, as Steve uh, likes to put it. And you may not see it today, but I guarantee that in a couple of years, and the, and the phone market is so amazing that it sort of changes every two years, that you will see a, a very dominant force there. So everything you do today on this stuff uh, is, is going to be something that you're going to reap the benefit of for many, many years to come. So thank you very much for being here, uh, for attending these talks. Uh, we really appreciate it. I am really, really, really looking forward to what sort of applications you guys built and then who goes to Hawaii. So that will be sort of very cool. Thank you. Thanks. So there is one uh, uh, action that we need to do. I need to do, talk about some housekeeping today. Uh, after you're done eating, can you please just clean up around yourself, you know, uh, Tomorrow morning, there are lectures here also. Now, in the next lecture series, next lecture, which is next week, next Thursday, we'll have an open mic time where we'll give you an opportunity to pitch an idea in case you're looking for a team member, in case you're looking for feedback for your idea. It would be a time to come up front, have three, four minutes, maybe five, talk about that idea, and talk to other people what they think about that idea. Because the constant feedback we are getting is that you have ideas, but you want to talk to more people, maybe form teams, maybe get some critique. So that's going to be next week. Over to Carla. Hi. Um, so I actually didn't know Victor was talking today, but his talk sort of is a nice transition to what I'm going to do today. Um, I'm not on the Windows phone team. I'm actually in office in my spare time. I was playing around with building apps and what I found was just it was really easy to get started and then to get apps out there. Um, so I mean for a lot of my friends at coworkers at Microsoft and I was asking my intern is like you know what's the thing that's stopping people from starting and, and I, I sort of was guilty of this too with with other uh, app ecosystems was and I don't know where to get started you know is it hard you know what do I need to do and so I wanted to spend you know 30 minutes and just sort of go over that with everyone and say Look, it's easy. I'll build an app. 
um, and I'm even going to walk through the steps of submitting to the marketplace. Um, so if I have time, I'll come back to the slides. I have some lessons learned and things like that in here. But uh, I'm going to get out of here and go straight into Visual Studio. So once you download the tools, which uh, if you don't have that information, we'll, we'll get to you at the, at the end. Um, you just say foul, new project. Ah, it already is. Well, it might have switched back on me, so let me, let me give that a try. Yeah. So there is there is a way to auto size this. We we did it before, so maybe we could. Oh, there we go. I think it's working. All right. So I'll say new project, in. One of the things that everyone should take advantage of is there's lots of <laughs> templates. Making sure I was on high performance. Um, so these are great places to start. Um, so for mine, I'm going to do a data bound app because I'm actually going to connect to the internet, download some news feeds, and display them in my app. So I'll call my app. It's really slow for some reason, but Golf News. And for now, I'm just going to target 7.0. And the great thing about this template is, is it does a lot of the plumbing and work for me. So without writing any code, I always like to just you know, hit F5 and see what it gets me. So I have a list of items, and I could click on them and view the detail. And hitting back goes back to the main page. Um, and the way it does that is with a design pattern called model view view model. And you try to read about it online, it may sound complicated at first, but don't worry about it. It's, it's all set up for you. Um, so for my example, I'll add a reference to my uh, web server, which I got it there. Hit go, and Visual Studio will, will find my web service, write a bunch of code also to make my life easy. And I will say it's a golf or, you know, golf news service seems fine. So it, it just wrote a bunch of code for me, and that's that's great. So the way this works is I write my code in the view model, and the UI will automatically get updated. I don't have to say, when this, when this particular event happened, update the UI. That, that just happens automatically. So I'll remove some of the sample stuff that they put in here. Um, and this has a load data uh, function. So I'm actually not going to use any of this, so I'll just delete it. And instead, I'll say, Golf service reference dot feed service client, and I'll create a client. And for my client, okay, I was just wondering why that red line was there. My client, I'm going to call get news async. So what this is going to do is make a call up to my server, and it'll return back the data. Uh, and when that data is returned, I'm going to call a get news completed event. So after a while, you'll learn the shortcuts, but um, really just hitting tab will write all this plumbing for you. So let me scroll over so you guys can see this better. The first thing you always want to do when data is returning is from the internet is, is make sure you don't have an error. So if e dot uh, error. So if there's an error, I, I want to do something about that. And that's really important with these mobile apps because the wireless connect is, you know, it, it depends. Uh, you'll have lots of errors, and you'll, you'll fail app submission for this because it's something I've I failed personally. So, um, so you say message box dot show, and I'll just you know just display something here like check your data connection, and don't want to do anything else after that. So I'll just exit. Um, so from from here I I have some data, and I would say. This app used to have this items collection up here. Um, and I want to assign whatever this is returning to that items collection. So this.items equals e.result. So if I actually try to compile this right now, it's going to give me an error, which actually I don't even need to do that. It's telling me that already. And it's because it's expecting a feed item where up here it was defined as this uh, generic class that they gave me as, as the example. So 
uh, what was it? Golf service reference dot feed item. So this is basically the class that's being returned into here. Um, so I need to change that in these two places. Um, and the very last bit of code I need to do, which I almost forgot and the app wouldn't have worked, was to uh, basically send a message out to the world that says this item has changed. So notify that my property has changed an item. So this is actually all the code I'll need to write for this demo, hopefully, unless I made any mistakes. So if anyone noticed me making typos, feel free to scream them out. Um, so on my main page, there's these different items. And I'll sort of scroll to it over here. There's, it was binding to an object called line 1 and line 2. Uh, for my demo, I'm actually not going to use line 2, so I'm going to remove that. And instead of using line 1, I'm going to say this was the title of my feed object. Um, and then whenever I would click on one of those, it would take me to the details page. And let me just resize here. This is sort of the, the same thing over here. It has line one. I'm going to say display my title there. Oops. And instead of line three, that's where I'm going to say put my description. So let's see if this actually is working. And I have an internet connection. So I'm returning a bunch of news feeds. Not f formatted too nicely, but that's all right. And I get into here, and I see some detail. Um, so, you know, looking at this, I definitely don't want to submit just yet. I want to probably put my application name up here, give some details, format these a little better. So let's jump back to the UI. Uh, instead of my application, I'll call this Connected Golfers News. And probably need to do that on my other page as well. Um, so the one thing I noticed was that... Uh, this text is just way too big. Um, so I'll, there's already some styles in here. I could create my own, but I actually took a guess that there's an extra large. There's probably a large as well, so I'll just use that. And at the top of the page, there was a title. So I'll just call this Golf News. And same thing up here. So this, this is where the apps and Metro sort of puts their brand. So connected golfers. And let's, let's see how I'm doing. I, I like this sort of iterative approach where I, I keep going back and looking. So I'm getting there, but it's, it's sort of all just blurring together to me right now. Um, so one of the ways that I, in a few of my apps, I've done this, so I'll, I'll do it here as well, to sort of hook those together is uh, I'm going to make this stack panel, which basically says any items that are inside of it, stack them up and down and say the orientation instead is horizontal. And put a rectangle at the beginning that's a width of 10 pixels and a height of about 70, because its container is 78. And it'd be invisible right there, so I need to say it has a fill of green. Um, there's one other thing I need to do, just, just from memory here, is uh, I need to give this a width. And I'll say about 400 pixels. Um, so we'll see how this is looking so far. So it's getting better. And you can imagine if you know, I, I spent another 20 minutes, maybe I'd give some fancy animations when I'm flipping back and forth. And um, some of these news feeds that I'm pulling down from my server just actually don't have any data there. That's why they're empty. Um, but for the most part, I have a working app. And I mean, we jump back to my code. There wasn't a lot here. Like, there's plenty of examples like this online that are way more involved. But I'm purposely pick, picking something easy. Like, I could submit this in, you know, actually, that's the next part of the demo. Uh, but there's a few more things to sort of clean up this app. Um, right now, I have some pretty ugly icons that you actually can't submit with. So I need to find some better ones. Um, so let me say, open Windows a folder. So instead of me actually making icons in front of you, if I, I've pre-made two. And I'm just going to paste them into this folder. 
there's just two JPEGs in here. Um, so I come back to my app. An important thing to remember is recompile or you'll scratch your head for a while like I was doing last night trying to figure out why this actually wasn't working. And resubmit or rebuild. So I have a, my new icons in there. They look good. These are actually different icons, so it's, it's good to test both. But I do notice that it tried to guess at the name of my app, which isn't really that good. I can edit that if I want, which is, I think it's this one. Um, Golf News with a space, and I think it appears somewhere else there. So let's build. Uh oh. <laughs> so I just check that out again. Golf News didn't work probably because I didn't recompile. So the, there, there's always a few gotchas that are going to leave you scratching your head, and, and you'll slowly learn that what they are. So good. So now I think I'm ready. I have an app that you know isn't great. Probably no one's going to buy this, but uh, if they do, great. Um, some people may accidentally buy it, and that's fine too. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I won't say much about the quality of my apps, but some of them get downloaded, and that's cool. Uh, so jumping over to the create.msn.com or msdn.com. Uh, once you have your account and uh, that takes a little bit of work to get set up, but there's steps for all that online as well. You have your dashboard. Uh, so I have a new submit new app button. I click that, and I have to give this a very descriptive name. Golf News. Uh, I could choose to submit for different languages, but I'm just going to submit for Windows Phone with English. I could give it a version. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start off with 1.0. And at this point, I need to just select my, my app. So open containing folder. So that your, your app package is a ends in .xap. This is actually just a zip file. If, you, if you're wondering, you could actually rename it and, and dig into there and see what they put in there. But it's just your binaries packaged up. Um, so let me copy this path. Sure. Debug. Does it matter? Um, I probably should compile ship. Um, at the end, I'm I'm not actually going to hit submit, um, but <laughs> I'll get to that point and not do it. Uh, but yeah, you and there's actually other talks that were given in the past and videos of obfuscating and and instrumenting your binary, which is also very useful to do. Um, and it looks like I'll have time to talk a little bit about some other stuff since I ran into no problems today, which. I was worried I'd have network issues and all that as well. Um, developer notes, tester notes, or if I have an account, I'd put some information in here for the testers to, to know how to use my app. But hopefully, it's straightforward enough for them. Um, this is important and a mistake I've made multiple times. Uh, to set this correctly, um, I'd say this is sports, but I've mistakenly submitted to games multiple times. and. Then I'm always looking for my app and like, why is no one downloading it? Where is it at? And like, no one's interested in golf nudes in the game section. Um, so I'll just write a description here. You want to make these as a, sort of like a teaser to make people download your apps. Uh, this is sort of the marketing part that I wasn't really ready for, um, but it's really important. You want to have nice icons. You want to come up with the sort of Something that makes people want to spend the, the, the time to download your app. Uh, so I'll just say, get awesome golf news. Uh, probably not that great. And I could give it keywords, say this is golf or news or USGA, things like that. Um, actually, I meant to put that in the keywords. Um, in the featured app description is, if you're lucky enough to get featured, I think they put a little blurb next to it. Uh, so I'll just put something funny here, and you know I'm, I'm not that big yet. I don't have legal teams, so I don't have a legal URL, and uh, I don't really care about supporting this right now either. <laughs> um, so 
Uh, th this is where you upload all your artwork. Um, so I had a folder here with all my icons. That's not it. Uh, So all my icons here. Um, I have a screenshot and just a bunch of various uh, icons in here as well. Should have copied that folder because I can never remember where I put it. So they want these different sizes of images um, because Different images appear in different places. Uh, some places in the marketplace you'll get a big 200 uh, by 200 pixel. Some views you only have a little small 64 inch one. Um, so I typically will use the, the same icon for each, but you can do different ones. And this large background is if you're in the Zoom marketplace, you'll see this behind your, your app. If you're familiar with Zoom, like that's where you see people's music uh, or the artists behind the music. Um, in my one screenshot, so we're just chugging along here. Um, here's where I'd probably, you know, try to figure out what I want to price it, and you know, it's an it's an awesome app, so <laughs> pick like forty six dollars. Uh, if you want to make it available for trial, uh, I'd sort of recommend that too. You'll get a lot more downloads uh, if you have a trial, but then you have to sort of have something that draws people to want to give you the dollar after you get them to download. Um, but in reality, I, I would I'd probably just submit this as a free app. Um, and at some point, ah, so I, see I used the wrong images. But you have to use P PNG to the developer team if they're here. It would be nice to tell me back when I was um, doing <laughs> that. Uh, so if I would correct that, you know, at the very end, there's a, a button to actually you know, submit. That should probably be a compile error, actually, since it's in the zap. Um, so that's, you know, submitting an app in, in 30 minutes. I think I probably actually did that in 15. Um, so I did have some slides of my lessons learned as a Windows Phone developer. Um, so I have about 18 out there right now, but in reality I don't have that many. I have golf apps, shotguns, guns, Coin tosses, sirens, news readers, um, pretty wide spectrum. But my takeaways for everyone is ship as early as possible. You can get into this sort of feeling where you just want to keep adding features and you always come up with a great idea or thing you want to fix or tweak. Um, in the end, you may never ship. Uh, so I'd much rather put something out there and then realize no one download. No one's actually downloading it. Then you know, spending a year working on it and then finding out no one's downloading it. Um, and a quote I've heard a while ago: uh, If you're not embarrassed by your V1 product, you've waited too long to ship. And I could say that about pretty much everything I've put out there. And, and some I'm still embarrassed to say, like, hey, that's under my name. Um, <laughs> but you know, that that's fine. Like, you may put something out there and find out that it's downloaded a lot. And and I actually had one like that. It was on a dare. I said, yeah, I'll build an app in two hours. And wow, like it was downloaded a lot. And I you know, rushed home at night and actually made it good before I got a bunch of bad reviews. And um, you know, I had a bunch of bad reviews at first. And then I was able to update it. And then I saw a bunch of reviews that said, hey, this guy actually in improved his app. Like, that's great. They took our comments. So that was, that was sort of cool to see. Um, you got to fight your uh, urge to code. Um, and by that, I mean. I'm a coder, I love to get in there and sort of prototype and code. But the biggest sort of thing I found out is I got note cards, you know, standard note cards, and used that as my fake app screen. Um, and then I would just sort of order them in, the, in like a, a sort of a workflow. And I'd flip the app, or flip the note cards and sort of walk through my app. And I often fixed a lot of bugs or ba bad design at that point. And it was as easy as sort of just like throwing the note card to the side and drawing another one. Um, and I mentioned th this, which is a mistake that I, I, I have done from time to time. Be careful with selecting your app type, because uh, I just did this again this past weekend. Um, it was already there, I updated it, but it switched back to games for some reason, and you know, I have another app in the game section. Um, so you have to figure out if you want to go free or paid or trial with, or with the option to buy. 
Um, and really, I tell everyone, do it all. Like, find a way to show up as many places as possible. Um, I found that free apps will get downloaded way more, like thousands of times more, versus the same exact app that has a paid with a trial. Um, some people just search for free apps, so you want to get those, and other people will search for paid apps, and you want to get those as well. Um, and what I do is in my free apps, I have advertisements. And I always put a button there. Well, backing up a little bit, people would complain that there's advertisements. So I put a button in the app that said, don't like ads, remove them. And if they click the button, it takes them to the marketplace to buy the paid one. Um, and a lot of people don't like ads enough that they will buy it. Uh, even though it's the same exact app minus ads. Um, and if your app isn't selling, I try to figure out why. It may be something stupid, it may be a bad icon, you may have just gotten unlucky. Uh, so change the name, change some styles, resubmit it. Um, and I've actually found that to, to work. The same exact app, like I got lucky the second time and it took off. Um, Cross-promoting your app is also important. Um, I had a shotgun app and I was building a guns app. So I updated the shotgun app and said, hey, you want more guns? Check out this other app. And the day after I sent that update out, like my download soared. It was really cool to see, like, you know, and I'd, I'd recommend doing that across the board. Um, so these are where I've typically failed submitting my apps by not having my contact information, by not having version information in the app. I think you don't need these two anymore, but I'm still putting them in after failing a couple times for that. Um, the back button behavior on pop-up. So what actually will happen if, if you have an app, you pop up a login screen or something. If the person hits the back button, it should close the login screen. And the common mistake I would make and other people would make is you hit the back button and it will actually take you back a page. Uh, so that's just a little bit of code you have to put in there to handle that and you'll, you'll get by. Um, the white versus black theme uh, is important. And the way I, I sort of get myself around this is typically in the emulator, I will always set the emulator to white. Um, I don't know why I was doing that. So, and I like to test with different colors as well. Um, it's very common to, to just forget to do this. So I always set the emulator to do in white and then when I actually try it out on my phone, I try out my phone in black, so it forces me to double check this. Because there's been times where I've submitted an app and text is unreadable because I said, oh, I always use black text here, but on a black background, it doesn't appear. Um, and I mentioned this one, the proper error handling for no data connection. But there is a doc, a PDF, where you could just read through these. And um, you know, I noticed trends where certain ones I was forgetting, so I actually printed out and highlighted them. And every time I submit, I sort of read over as my checklist. Um, so that's my talk. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Is there any, any questions? Yeah? Can you go into a little bit more detail about what you did for your server back end to just import everything and get a really easy to use feed? Um, yeah, so pull that up real fast. I Earlier today I said I better create a backup in case I don't have internet connection, so um, it's probably my recent projects. Yeah, so test site. Um, so this is sort of a test web service. So if you've never created web services, you know, there's a bunch of tutorials on that as well. Uh, but you just say right click, add new item in a Silverlight enabled web service. And it sort of creates some, some classes and examples for you. For this example, I have a really complicated class called a feed item, which has a title, description, publish date. And for my test app, I'm actually was only setting the title, a link, and a description. So I'm just adding a bunch of items to this. Uh, and what all that magic that uh, the tools build for you is it sees this class is, should be sent back down to the client. So in my test app, it will actually create those classes so I could reuse them in my client app. Um, in some other examples I had, I was just re reusing an RSS feed class that I, was out on the internet and I pulled down an RSS feed and, and converted it into that object. And I could bind to it just like I did in the other one. 
Any other questions? Yeah? Could you speak about um, your experience working with ads in your apps? Um, yeah, so ads are really easy to use. Um, I can't go to the website because you'd see my personal information. But there's an SDK that you download and uh, just maybe one line of code you, you paste in there and you type in your IDs. Uh, so you would say, here's my publisher ID and here's the ID of my ad. And on the web page I say, uh, show sports ads or show stock ads. And you know, I just hit F5 and the next time it loads, those ads are there. Uh, it's really easy to use and it's actually a lot more profitable than trying to sell your app. Um, so uh, this, the, same, the same app side by side, my free ones will always make a lot more money. Yeah? Um, do you have any other suggestions for how to promote your apps other than linking from your other apps? Um, I don't know. I'd be interested to hear what other developers say here. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I did, um, I, I created a website uh, that I'm going to make available to other de developers as well. Um, sometimes ads don't fill. Um, so whenever that happens, instead of showing nothing, I've decided I want to show an ad for my apps. Um, so what I have on my website is uh, you just, you could actually choose a percentage of 20% of the time show my, what I'm calling them house ads, which are just ads to my other apps. And I've actually found that the click-through rate for people seeing the ads and clicking it is like 15%, which is remarkable. But I sort of have an audience of people who like stupid apps, and I show them other stupid apps, and, and, they, and they go for it. Um, so if, if you're interested, uh, I don't know if I can promote, but it's adcontrolcenter.com. Um, you could check it out. It's not really publicly available to people yet, but you can get information there. But feel free to reuse that idea. But I was thinking, as I'm making this, uh, I might as well make it in such a way that I can make it available to you know, other developers. Um, so it's, it's free. I'm not going to make any money on it. Um, so. Josh, um, the marketing team is doing some sort of a promotion where they will highlight some yeah. of the apps. Yeah, spring cleaning or whatever it's yeah. called. Yeah. Yeah, so, so spring cleaning is uh, definitely something that's, that's going to end here. June 15th is the last uh, cutoff date for spring cleaning. Um, but another idea that I wanted to share that I saw uh, at Mix, a developer uh, who built an app called uh, Cocktail Flow, really beautifully designed uh, app that teaches you uh, drink recipes. They made a special version of their app for Mix, and they had all of these different Microsoft-themed cocktails so they had the X Rocks instead of the Xbox, and they had the Visual Teeny, and it sort of it was like a martini glass, and it had this. Uh, it was kind of a swizzle stick that looked like the Visual Studio logo. So it was it was really smart because everyone at Mix was you know you know there for Microsoft Technologies, but then they also did a trial app and generated their own unlock codes, and they handed out these unlock codes to everyone at the conference. So you could get their app for free. And I thought that was a really smart um, marketing tactic that they used. So that's just another idea of something I've seen that, that works really well. But as the, the gentleman over here was alluding to, getting your app promoted by the merchandising team is, uh, is really amazing. And you can see five to you know, tenfold increase in your daily downloads just by being featured in the marketplace. So I don't know if you've... Had that experience, I've, Carla. I've heard of people say like, "I don't know what happened, but did your app sales like skyrocket last Thursday?" And I'm like, "No, I bet you were featured and you didn't realize it." But they, they actually will see like the curves like that going like this, and it's like skyrocket, and then it comes back down. And they're like, "Is that a reporting error, or you know, did I just get really lucky?" And, and most likely they were featured. Um, so if you could get featured, that's awesome. Yeah. Are, are those unlock codes part of the framework, the APIs, or you have to implement your own logic to handle that? Yeah, they, the, the Cocktail Flow guys implemented their own. Okay. But, I, but the trial API is very flexible, um, so it gives you the ability to, to do that. Yeah, the trial, you should, it, it's actually, I didn't code for it for a while, but then I realized it's as easy as saying, like, application something is trial and then you can enable different content based on that. Um, so for me, I say, if is trial, uh, 
my ads are visible. Other, otherwise, I, d I don't actually put them on the page. Great. Thanks for your time, guys. All right, folks, I think I'll get started. Um, my name is Sean Henry. I'm a program manager on the application platform team as part of Windows Phone. Um, so that's the team that, um, uh, that sort of brings all the frameworks together and builds the application model for the phone and puts all the sort of great goo together that allows you to, uh, to build applications for the phone. Um, and then that was pretty cool. The speaker before us had like 50 apps in Marketplace. I only have two. Um, I have one game called Spin Crisis. You guys should take a look at that. It's free. And I also have another app <laughs> called... Uh, Called One Bus Away, which which guys, if you're if you're here, yeah, taking mass transit, taking the bus and that kind of stuff, uh, definitely take a look at that. It'll tell you when your bus is coming. Um, cool. Yep. Yep. And I'll just I'll plug our latest feature, which is really neat. You can actually subscribe if you go into your uh, uh, stops or route page and you press and hold on one of those stops, we will we'll send you a push notification five, ten, or fifteen minutes before your bus comes, so you'll never miss your bus again. It's pretty cool. Um, so, uh, here we go. So, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully all you guys have been playing with Windows Phone a fair bit. Hopefully most of you have Windows Phones. How many of you guys have Windows Phones that you're using? Awesome, of course, right? Uh, how many of those phones are on Mango? 7.5, a few of you. All right, if you can get a hold of a Mango phone, strongly encourage you to do that. It's really, really awesome. Um, you know, we released, I think, a really, really great OS in, um, in November with our initial release, but there was a ton of stuff that we really wanted to get in there that we didn't get in our first release, both the OS itself and in the application platform. Um, and a lot of that stuff made it into Mango, so there's a lot of really, really good features for users and for developers there. Um, and today I'm going to talk about some of the new stuff for developers, some of the really cool um, new things for developers. Um, I've got, you know, bunch of overview slides that I'm mainly going to talk to, and I've got some demos to really show off those, those features. Um, and then if I have time, because I know you guys are all trying to build a bunch of apps, I've got some pretty good tips on how to, how to build really great apps on the phone, some things you want to do before you submit to Marketplace. So if you have time, we'll get to those. So first of all, we just got a ton of new things in, in, in Mango. So I'll, I'll, again, as I said, you know, we released... The goal of Seven was really to release something that's a credible platform that's really easy for developers to build apps for. Um, you know, as you saw, as you saw, you know, you can build an app in 30 minutes. That's pretty cool. There's really no other platform you can do that. But there was a bunch of stuff missing. So I'm just going to cruise through this, and I'll get to more details later. But we added, you know, multitasking support. We really built out the framework. Um, we in integrated XNA and Silverlight. Um, we uh, we added more integration into the phone experiences. We really bumped up performance. We added database access. Um, we added more push notifications and tile, um, live tile things. And then also we made you know, Marketplace a lot better for when you're submitting applications and when you're getting applications. Framework? Sorry? Sorry, what's the phone framework? I'll get to that. Okay. Here we go. So here's kind of the big eye chart kind of of, of all the new features we added um, in Windows Phone Mango. Um, so. The first one, I'll just start off right at the beginning, camera. Tons of, our de tons of developers are really asking, asking for more access to the camera. In, in 7, all you could do is you could, if you're in your application and you wanted to take a picture, you could call into the OS and say, launch the camera application. The user could then take a picture, and then it will return the picture to your application, which was kind of good. I mean, if you wanted to just capture a picture and send it off somewhere, that was all right. Um, but what we, did, what we did in Mango is we really... Uh, beef that up a lot, so we gave you, um, you know, full access to the camera pipeline. So you can pull, um, you can pull raw data right off the sensor. You, so you can pull that in, in, in RGB format, or you can even pull it in the apps, in the raw format, right? The raw format the camera uses, which is YUV. Um, and the advantage you want to do that if you're doing things like um, barcode scanning or processing the data in such a way that you only only want to use um, the uh, the luminance value, the the the, um, the black and white basically, image. Um, you can do that a lot faster by just pulling off the YUV image and processing things that way. We also added, you know, full control, so you can, you can um, handle events from the shutter button. Um, so you can actually kind of build your own 
uh, photo application. And actually, I'll dive right in and I'll show you some of those. Some of the, I'll move here to the, promise me this would work. All right, I'll move here to the overhead. And actually, I'm going to switch to this guy. So I'll just show you, and hopefully you guys can get some ideas from here of some of the things you can build. Um, so as I mentioned, you can basically now build your own. This is probably going to go out of focus. I'll take a nice picture of, of nothing. Can you guys see that? Here, I can take a picture of my hand. So you know, we've, we've given you the framework to basically build your own camera application. This is like a really simple one here. So I can do things like, um, and I can overlay images on top of them, on top of my, uh, um, on top of my camera feed, and I can hit the actual shutter button here. And I've now taken a picture. I haven't gotten into the camera application. Cool. Um, I'll take another one here. And now this photo actually ends up, I can either grab the photo for my application if I want to use it, or in this case, this application, it sent it to my, um, um, to my pictures hub, hopefully. There we go, there's my beautiful fingers um, and a pen. So um, it's kind of one thing you can do with the camera in Mango. Really gives you nice uh, full access to the camera. The other thing, of course, actually I don't have a book up here, but the other nice thing you can do is, as I mentioned, you can do things like barcode scanning or, um, um, so I don't actually have a book. I forgot to bring one. but. If you want, we can see if this will work. We'll see. Of course, this will be the one book that doesn't work. <laughs> so this was a demo we did at Mix with where we worked with Amazon. And we built, there it goes. Nice. So uh, there we go. Is that, is that the right one? End layer domain oriented architecture guy with .NET 4. Wow. Wow. You must have trouble getting to sleep. <laughs> No, well, no, the barcode scanning is not, is not built in. Um, you'd have to do that yourself. Okay. Um, so, so what you actually get is you get the frame off the camera, um, and you can either pull those frames um, kind of as often as you want, um, or you can, you can have the camera tell you when preview frames are available. So basically you get a 640 by 480 frame in either RGB or YUV or just Y. Um, in that case, you just need Y because you just need the black and white, basically the black and white picture. Um, and then you can analyze that, find the barcode. And there's actually, there's tons of algorithms online if you want to use that. There's a bunch of other, I mean, you could, you could write tons of stuff. You can, you can use the, uh, you could probably write a reader for, for these codes here if you guys want, although we do have one in Marketplace already. Um, or you can do, you know, you can do all sorts of stuff with that. That one's like kind of a really cool feature. Um, so that's camera. I'll go back now. Talk about sensors. So in Windows Phone 7, we had access to the location framework, which gave you uh, data from the GPS. Um, so you could either figure out where your phone was, or um, you could have it uh, call back into your application when the uh, when the location changed, when your application's running, as well as accelerometer data, which will basically tell you which way down is. Um, in, uh, in Mango, we've added two new sensors. Actually, we've enabled another sensor. There was always a compass on the phone. All the phones have a compass, but we've enabled access to it um, uh, on phones that support it in Mango, as well as we've added a new sensor that some, phones, some new phones in Mango will have, which is a gyro. Um, and the advantage of the gyros is kind of, it's an, I don't know if you guys, know too much about it, but it's kind of, it's a nice relative orientation sensor, so it'll tell you, um, you know, if, if your camera, if your uh, phone's moving in a certain direction. And, um, you know, those are all great on their own, but what we did is we created what we call the spatial framework, or the motion framework. You got a picture of me with my finger on my nose. <laughs> um, which combines all that data together, so um, if you wanted to take you know, the GPS data and the accelerometer data and the compass data and the gyro data and build it all together to get a really good um, sen a fused sensor data, you'd have to do a lot of math, um, a lot of algebra. And I know, I know how much I loved matrix algebra. Um, so what we did is we did all that for you. So you can now, um, you can actually figure out sort of the, the yaw, pitch, and, and roll of your, uh, of your phone in real space. 
So I'll show you a quick demo of that also. Show you a couple demos of that, hopefully. So the demo I want to show is, well, actually, first of all, I will show you, um, I will show you on this one quickly just the compass. This isn't all that interesting, but you know we got a compass and we can tell which way north is. Um, and we can also also show you. So you couldn't do this in in um, in Windows Phone Seven because we didn't have access to the compass sensor. Um, this is an application that we actually shipped as a sample application in Windows Phone Seven. Uh, and it uses the accelerometer to tell you if your phone is level. So it's a nice little level application. But you can see that even though my phone is still level, when I move the phone around, that little dot moves. Right? And of course what's happening is because I'm only using the accelerometer, uh, when I move the phone like this, the data gets a little bit, uh, gets bouncy, right? Because I'm moving back and forth and left and right. So what I can do with our new uh, combined sensor APIs is I can, I can get exactly the same data, but I can have it use the, um, the gyro to really stabilize that. So you'll see the difference, whoops, that was the compass level, where, see? So with these new APIs, you don't get that bounce. It's still a level, right? It still moves when I actually tilt the phone, but you don't have any of those problems if you're shaking the phone. So what that lets you do is it lets you do really neat things like this. So this is an X and A application, so it's a game. And again, this one's going to be kind of hard to show. But what I can do is I can, yeah, you guys can't see that, but basically it gives you like a virtual view on a 3D environment. And you guys can come see this one later. I'll try and hold it up. But basically there's, there's a whole sort of landscape here. And I can move it around. And it's just like I'm looking into this 3D world. Um, it'll be hard to see from the back. Yeah. Do you get uh, sort of uh, the actual location of the phone in space and relative location as you move it? Yep. Or do you just get pitch roll and yaw? Um, so uh, you just get pitch roll and yaw. Um, you can get the absolute position using GPS. Um, and you can figure out the others, but we don't give them to you. We just give you pitch roll and yaw, or you can, you can, you know, come up one level and you can actually get the, the, um, the X, Y, Z, U matrix, um, which you can pull that info from. So that is camera and sensors. And actually, you can combine them together to do some kind of neat things. This is another one that may not show up so well. So this is the actual camera feed here. Can you guys see this? And what it's doing is it's kind of a heads up camera. So I can take this and I can go like this and I can say, oh, that door is west. You know, back of the hall is north. Um, and east is over here. And the compass works well in all orientations or does it work best when it's flat? Um, compass works okay in all orientations. One of the things you do have to do with the compass is it's very sensitive to, um, to magnetic interference. So, um, at least initially, especially initially, um, you might want to tell your users to sort of move the phone like this to, so the sensor can get a feel for uh, the magnetic gradient around it. Um, it'll get a lot better once it sort of figures that out, once it um, calibrates itself. And then also you can, with the, if you're using the motion APIs, um, having the gyro also built into that will smooth this out a lot. So if, if this had been, I can show you actually, the two compasses, this is like the raw compass data here. And you can see it's sort of bouncing around a lot as I move it. You guys can see that. And if I combine it with the gyroscope data, you see it's a lot smoother. So that's kind of the real advantage of the gyro is it smooths out the other things that, that you're trying to figure out from the sensor. You said the, the, the Windows 7 phones don't have a gyro, but the new ones will? Yes, that's right. That's right. Not unless you have one of these. <laughs> so uh, we, we are going to have uh, 
a few of those phones available if you're building apps as part of the contest this summer. So if you want to take advantage of the gyro in your app, we'll have those and we'll talk about that later as we get into the series. Is this the one that Verizon is now selling? No, it looks just, just like, looks it. like it. It's but it's a different it's a different model. So what happens for apps that utilize the gyro when you install them on older phones? Um well, the driver won't be available. If you're using the, the motion APIs, which is what we recommend, um, we'll fall back to using uh, only the compass and the accelerometer, or only the accelerometer, if that's all that's available. I think, uh, yeah, we'll definitely fall back. Um, From a developer, do I have to do any error checking specifically for that case? Or no, not if you're using the motion APIs. If you access the gyro directly, so there's different classes. There's, there's an accelerometer class, there's a compass class, there's a location class, which is the GPS, and there's a gyro class. If you try and access the gyro directly, um, it, it won't work. Um. So camera, sensors, networking. So one of the big things that we really wanted to get into the initial release of Windows 7 that we didn't was, was socket support. Um, so, if you, so we have pretty good you know, HTTP support in, in 7 and even better in Mango, but we didn't really have support for talking to network sockets. So if you wanted to you know, build an, an IRC application um, or do any sort of uh, UDP peer-to-peer -peer networking on, on a subnet, you really couldn't do that um, in, 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 in Windows Phone 7. Both Mango, we've enabled that, so we've enabled TCP sockets um, and UDP sockets. Um, so you can build sort of applications that talk to um, more compl complex uh, web services that are, well, not web services, um, network services. Um, and then we've also added more control for our connection manager. In 7, there was an API where you could tell if you were on a um, uh, 3G type connection, a cell connection, or a Wi-Fi connection. Um, in, in Mango, we've, we've allowed you to actually bind particular connection, bind connections to, um, to a particular uh, source, so either Wi-Fi or, or 3G. Um, so if you have something that requires Wi-Fi, for instance, if you don't want to do a big download and you only want to do that over Wi-Fi, you can ensure that that connection always stays over Wi-Fi. Um, the other one we added uh, is, is uh, support for, um, for SQL, SQL CE, so database support. Um, in Windows Phone uh, 7, all you had was isolated storage, which is the isolated storage for your application where you could write files. You had your own little sandbox where you could read and write files however much you wanted. Um, and some people actually implemented databases on top of that, you know, purely managed databases. But we've now um, used our native database on the phone to give you access to um, structured data um, in SQL CE. So we do that by using Link to SQL. I don't know how many, hopefully most of you are familiar with Link. Um, it's a really, really simple way to, to access um, structured data. Um, and that's kind of what we were going for when we picked Link to SQL was we really Wanted it to be easy. Uh, we've also uh, given people more access to contacts. I think contacts was supposed to be in this blue square, and I think it disappeared. Um, contacts and calendar. So there was no way to, uh, to get sort of read access to the contacts data or the calendar data on the phone in Windows Phone 7. So we've added that. Um, you, can, you can, it's read-only access, but you can now get access to, um, to here we go to all of uh, full information, so contact name and picture, any other metadata that's in the database, um, as well as any appointments for anyone that's in, um, that's in the contact, the, the phone user's live database. So if it's live IDs or um, Outlook, Exchange, anything like that, you get full data there. In the case of Facebook, which so we have full integration with Facebook um, on the phone for the core experiences, but to access it from a third-party app, you only get access to the contact name and picture. Uh, for everything else, for you know, Twitter integration and all those other cool things that are in um, Mango, the other networks, is you, you don't get access to any of that. So if it's in the live database, you get everything. If it's Facebook, you get name and picture. Otherwise, you don't get anything. I and mean, again, that's read-only access. Um, so you can integrate that into your application also. I think. Uh, I will do so. Launchers and choosers. So we added um, a bunch of new launchers um, 
in choosers in Mango. Um, so what these are, in case you don't are not familiar with the terminology, is they're ways to access phone functionality. So we had like a web browser uh, launcher in seven that would take you out to IE, and you could launch a web page. Um, and we've added a bunch more in Mango. We've added a, a Maps one, so you can pass a location, and it'll bring up our, our Maps experience of that location. Um, we've added a uh, an address chooser, um, where you can uh, get addresses, a game invite task, so you can invite people to a game, a ringtone task. So you can act. This is kind of neat, actually. You can um, create a ringtone application that will save applica save uh, ringtones to the store on the phone. So you can now kind of create your own ringtone marketplace if you want, which is kind of neat. Um, yeah, maps and directions and address. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Sean, who was here last week, talked too much about this, but we also added a ton of controls um, into Silverlight. Well, actually, we didn't add that many controls, but we made the controls we had a lot faster. Um, the panorama and the pivot controls, um, which are kind of the, 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 really, the really sexy user experience controls that we have on the phone. I'm sure you guys are familiar with sort of the, the, the pano experience and the pivot experience. So we made those a lot faster. And those are all part of the Silverlight toolkit, which is open source and is available on CodePlex. Um, if you guys, actually, that's a really good place to learn sort of some best practices for, uh, for building uh, Silverlight applications on the phone, because some, some of our best coders over in Silverlight wrote those things, uh, wrote those controls. So if you, want, if you want to see some good code, take a look at that. Um, and then the other big thing, actually, that's not on here that kind of goes over everything is that in, in Windows Phone 7, there were two frameworks to choose from. There was XNA for developing games, um, and then there was Silverlight for developing sort of event-based applications. And that was great because XNA was really good at building games, um, and Silverlight was really good for building um, rich UIs. I thought such a great text controls and and buttons and, and manipulation events and animations and that kind of stuff. But um, it, was, it made it really difficult, for instance, I don't know if you guys have used XNA, but it can be really painful to build things like menus and, 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 um, uh, and add text. You know, you have to use write fonts in XNA. Also, in Silverlight, it can be really hard if you want to do 3D, if you want to do like a spinning globe or something like that. It can be really painful to do that in, in uh, Silverlight. So what we've done in Windows Phone Mango is we've mashed them all together. So you can now create Silverlight plus XNA applications. Which is really neat, actually, because it means you can do some neat things like this. Actually, I'll use this phone. So. Oh, thank you. So I will show you here. So what we have here is we have uh, a Silverlight application. I mean, this looks a little bit like the, the template application that comes up. So this is a Silverlight page. Um, and if we click this button, now we've moved into XNA. So this is a full 3D environment where we can do rotations and translations and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's one thing you can do. You can sort of separate the two. So you can see where that would be useful if you're building a game um, and you want to have uh, menus or high score screens or some, or some pages like that. And you, you don't want to have to have to redo all those controls. The other one that's really neat is you can actually um, you can actually use Silverlight inside of XNA. So this one here, so this is a this is a 3D tank in XNA with um, Silverlight controls on top of it. So you can actually mix and match. And what's actually happening is um, you're rendering Silverlight to a texture in the foreground. Uh, you're so you're rendering your Silverlight stuff to a texture every frame, and then you're splatting that on top of, of your scene every frame. So and we can do things like this. We can get our manipulation events from either XNA or Silverlight. And actually, what I think is really cool, you saw that animation? So those type of animations, if you've ever done them in a game, are kind of tricky to do. But they're really easy to do in Silverlight. So what we actually did in that case is we hooked up Silverlight storyboard animations to this XNA scene, um, which you know, made it literally 
literally actually there was, there was no code because you can go build the animation in, in, in Blend or whatever you like and then hook it up to, um, to the XNA scene. There's a little bit of code. I, I lied a little bit. You do have to hook it up. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. It's a lot easier than trying to do that in XNA. So, kind of neat, I think. Hopefully you guys are getting some ideas for the awesome apps you're going to build. The other big one, the big one that we really, that we really, come on. Up top one. Nope. Lost it. Here we go. Maybe. Showing up here. Here we go. The other big one that, of course, everyone was asking for was multitasking. So multitasking can mean a lot of things, um, especially on a phone where you really can't multitask. I mean, you can't actually do two things at the same time because it's such a small screen. Um, so it's not multitasking like you have on the desktop where you have um, you know, multiple windows open at the same time and a bunch of things going on. It's not necessarily appropriate for a phone. Um, but we did a bunch of things sort of under the multitasking umbrella in Mango. One is we did uh, fast application resume, which, um, which is just a really great way of, of, of speeding up the launch of applications on the phone or backing into applications. Um, and what that, what that really means is that in 7, when you navigate it away from application, so you're in your application and you hit the Windows menu, uh, the Windows button or the search button or whatever, your application actually gets terminated. It gets an, a deactivated event, gets sent to it. It's got a few seconds to shut everything down, and that process is gone. If the user backs into that application, the application has to start again, figure out all that state that it's squirreled away somewhere, and, and, um, and rebuild itself. What we've done in Mango is um, if the application has opted into this, which by default new applications built for Mango will, um, we'll actually suspend um, all the threads that are running and we'll detach all the resources that it's using while it's in the background. When the user uh, backs back into that application by hitting the back key. Instantaneously, we'll let those threads resume and we'll reattach those resources and your app is just running right away. Um, so it's a super, super instantaneous, super, super quick experience. Um, yeah, so that's kind of all I'm going to say about that. The other thing we've done is we've added uh, background agents, which are actually um, pieces of code that can, that can be allowed to run in the background under different conditions. And actually, what I'll do, I'll back up to that fast application switching, because this is kind of an important thing for, um, for you guys to know if you're kind of new to Windows Phone development. In, um, in Windows Phone 7, we had um, a fairly simple state diagram for the states that applications can be in. So your application should be running, so the user launches your application. And they're using it and it's running, and now they hit the, the, the start key, the Windows key, um, and the application moves to the deactivated state. So, like I said, the process gets terminated. You have a couple seconds to clean everything up, save your state. In Mango, your application then moves to a dormant state, which is this suspended state where the threads are, are, are just uh, um, uh, are suspended by the OS. The application doesn't get to do anything, but it doesn't know. Um, that it's not running, the process hasn't been terminated. Phone detached resources, everything's suspended. The application can then move to the activated state. And you can rehydrate all your data, and you can start running again. At any time though, fast app resume, great. At any time, if there's memory pressure on the phone, or if enough applications have moved in front of that application, so if I, you know, if I launch Facebook, then I launch Twitter, then I launch a whole bunch of applications, um, and I get too far back in the back stack, the application will get tombstone. So you have these two states you have to remember about. And I'll talk about this if I have time a little bit later. This is one of the biggest things that you have to, you have to think about when you're uh, building applications for Windows Phone is this state model. You should get it like 
tattooed on your hand or something. Um, because you really have to think about it. Any time your application can move into this dormant state, because the users hit that Windows key or the search key, and at any time while it's sitting in the background, it can move the tombstone, in which case the process is terminated. So you have these two cases you really have to think about. There's actually, there's lots of good resources on MSDN for how to do this right. Um, but it is something that's, that's really important. Yes, this is fine. Uh, background agents. So we added a whole bunch of uh, background agent, uh, well, a whole bunch of ways to fill some background agent scenarios in, in Mango. So I mentioned if you want to resume, okay. So everyone should, should do this, fast app switching, but it sort of fell into the multitasking banner. We also added the ability to uh, set an alarm at a precise, so if you want to remind the user of something, like if you want to build an app that's like take your pills or something, um, you can create an alarm. So you have new APIs to do that. You get a notification just like the calendar notifications you get on the phone. And you can click on those into the app or the user can dismiss them or whatever. So we have that functionality. Um, if you want to download large files and you know, one of, one of the cases like maybe you want to download a large file but then the user's like, oh, this is downloading. I'm just going to navigate away. Well, now your app is suspended and you're not actually downloading that file. So they come back and they have to download the file again. So if you have large downloads, we uh, created a background transfer service where you can pass the, UR, the URLs to those files and our download manager will take care of it and download those files for you and put them in isolated storage. We also added, um, yeah, so if you want to do events. So these, this is a feature that was in 7, was push notification. I'll talk about this one a little bit later, so I won't actually go into that one right now. Um, if you want to do, um, you know, uh, location-based services, tile toast updates, data pre-caching using background agents, a periodic background agent. So what a back, periodic background agent is, is an agent that gets to run uh, for a fixed, a fixed small amount of time, like 30 seconds every 30 minutes. Um, and the, the OS will manage that, will manage that agent. And what it can do in that time slice is it can do things like if you have, um, uh, if you have a, uh, an application that wants to maybe cache data, and this is actually a really good one. If you want to cache data so your application launches quickly, you can go and grab that. So if you're like Facebook and you want to grab the latest status updates, and maybe you want to push them to a tile, if the user's got the tile pinned to the start screen. Um, but then you also want to have them ready so when the user launches the application, you don't have to go out to the service. You can still go out to the service, but at least you have some pretty recent data right away. Because we've all had that case where like, you haven't used Facebook, or Twitter or whatever in, in a couple days, and you go there and the, the status updates are like three days old. That's not really very useful, and it's sitting there with the dots going across um, trying to get data. Um, so if you have these background agents, you can, you can keep that data more or less up to date. And actually, that's a really good one. If you want to make your application feel fast, even more important than, I think, doing fast app switching, which actually is, is pretty easy to do, so I would do that anyways, is, to do background agents because if you think of when you when you launch an application, um, really, you know, what is it? There's a bunch of time where the OS has to do a bunch of stuff to load your application. Then there's a bunch of time where you have to do stuff to load all your resources. And if you have fast app switching, that takes, you know, milliseconds. It's super, super fast. But then what takes most time on most applications is that initial fetch of data, right? You launch Facebook and it's got to go get data. And that can take like five, ten seconds um, to get that data. And if you already have that data pre-cached, you have that instantly. So now you've moved what was, you know, if you didn't have fast app switching and you didn't have uh, a background agent, your app might have been taking 10 seconds before it was actually usable, and now it's usable instantaneously. Um, and that's like a huge, huge delighter for users because the application feels really snappy. We also added two types of... Uh, uh, background audio players. Oh. We have uh, ba uh, two, two separate mechanisms for doing uh, audio in the background. Um, a background audio player and a background streaming player. A background audio player, um, you basically just pass uh, a bunch of URIs to um, audio files, MP3s or whatever, and our Zune media player will manage that and will play those files in the background. Um, 
even when you navigate away from the application, it'll integrate them also with the UVC. And I'll show a demo of that in a second. Actually, I'll show a demo of that right now. So if I move over to here. So this is, this is actually an app that an intern on our team wrote just the other day. Um, and what it is, is it's, it's a weather news application. So it figures out where you are. It's figured out that I'm in Redmond. Um, and it goes to the, um, I think the NOAA web service and looks for, um, looks for audio of the current weather conditions. So there we go. Huh. Why does it think I'm in Illinois? Here we go. At 7.00 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time at Binghamton Regional Airport. So that's kind of annoying, but I can, uh, it's still playing while the, um, the temperature was 47 degrees, the dew point 46. And so, the I, so, I, so I can still have it playing uh, while I've navigated away from the application. And actually, you know, one of the things that's actually still a bug in this application is that you can go forward and backwards. Um, so basically what he's done is he's built a playlist. Um, of, of a bunch of MP3 files that Noah makes available. And he's handed that off to our Zoom queue. Um, so I can get, here we go, here's Redmond. Rain, probably rain and cold, right? No? All right. So that's one, we'll stop that. So that's a, like a really simple background audio agent if you have just MP3s. The other option is you have something a little bit more complicated where you actually have to de decode the audio on your own. So an example that we have there is, is um, you know, you can, go ahead. Uh, is it possible to change the controls that drop down, or you're always limited to previous play, pause, and next? Um, well, you see, you can disable them. So let me see, actually, I can show that here. So uh, here's Shoutcast, where you actually have to do a little bit of work to decode the stream. There we go. And this will also continue to play, or not. Well, normally that would continue to play. Let's try one more time. Hmm. There we go. So that's still playing. And you can see, you can sort of see that those, uh, those controls are grayed out if they don't make sense for your application. So can you make like custom controls for the um, I don't, I don't think, let me get back to you on that one. Okay. I'm not sure if you can or not. Um, I will just quiet yeah, that. Um, developer data, can you get to like their music library or like pictures? Um, yeah, you can't, well, you can't, um, you can get it through, there's, there's launchers and, and there's choosers that allow you to choose a picture from their library. So you can ask the OS to then return you a picture. So it's like a picture picker, um, which, so, so you can launch that and the user sees their library and they browse their, their, you know, their picture library just like, right, they basically get this screen here. Uh, not quite this one. I think it's this one. And they can, you know, pick some photos, and, they, and then you can return that photo to you. When are these tools available? That's a good question. Tools are available now. Please correct me. I keep hitting laptop two, and he make, puts me on laptop one. That's great. Um, tools are available now. Uh, you can download them from MSDN. Um, uh, so yeah, definitely get those today. Um, and I think the build that's on the phone that Ben, Ben's been sort of handing out letting people use will work with those tools. Um, so yeah, you can, definitely, you can definitely start on all this stuff today. Um, and then the final type of agent we have is we have a synchronization agent, which is kind of like the periodic background agent, but it runs when the phone is, is plugged in and charging and on Wi-Fi. So if you want to do like a lot of heavy syncing, you know, if you want to sync videos or something like that, in your application, that's what you would use. Is that like state of identity broker or one of the things called in Windows Mobile where you could know if it was plugged in and if the battery level was 20% or under? Does that return that data back? Yes, yeah, so you don't actually get that data from the app. You just get told, hey, you can run now because you've reached that state. So we control what that state is. Um, it's a question at the back. If I set up something with the periodic background agent, do I have to worry about the app getting tombstoned and then that whatever I set up not running? 
so the question was, do I have to worry about the um, application getting tuned soon if I set up a periodic background agent? So they're two separate processes. So you actually, um, um, you actually create a separate project inside your solution that's your background agent. Um, and then from, from your application, you um, call a bunch of APIs to hook that up. Um, and then the OS will call that background agent on your behalf. So it's a separate process. Um, so it's not, it's not like the, the foreground process running. It's actually separate code. Separate. Yep, the back. Um, I might have missed this, but uh, if you already have a Windows phone, what's the best way to get a build of the phone so that we can actually test out our Mango and Apple apps? Finn? I would say the best thing to do is to continue to come to ZapFest. Because we have, uh, I, I have phones here today. So you know, if, if we come in and, and you want to borrow a phone for the night, uh, to do some testing at a Zap Fest, that's fine. Okay. Uh, if are you an intern? Yeah. Uh, are you going to do the contest? Yeah. So we will have loaner phones that we'll make available to people who register for the contest, and you'll be able to check those out for the for the summer. Does the emulator spoil these things? The emulator doesn't give you the gyro. Is that, that's right. That, that's right. So the well, so it sort of depends. I mean, some of them. Some of them kind of don't make sense to the emulator. So the camera, for instance, right? The, the, the multitasking. multitasking is supported, yeah, yeah. Yep. yep. One multitasking question I've noticed uh, that when I go into the task switcher on my Mango device, mm -hmm. I see multiple instances for certain applications because it seems like it's storing paths instead of applications. Like, I'll have two instances of the email app, uh, depending um, on when I press the home button. That's the question is that you're seeing stuff in, in the in the the application switcher when you press and hold the back key. Yeah. Um, there's two possibilities. One, that's a bug. It's getting fixed. Maybe. I don't actually know. Um, the other possibility is that um, uh, if it's sort of different instances of the app. So if it's like different mailboxes and stuff, I, I think it would probably show up as I two different. Is the way the interaction model works is everything is like a path. Yep. I go to one application, then I go to another application. Yep. Every yep. time I press the home button, it's saved as a state. Yes, but but if but if it's the same process, um, if it's the same process, so if you have you know process A and, or application A, then application B, then application C, and then you go back into application A, that should get moved to the front of the stack, and you shouldn't see it in there anymore. Yeah, um, it may be a little different for some of the native experiences, depending on what they are, because they get to play around with it a little more. Um, but for third-party applications, that's what happens. Um, so some other cool stuff. How am, I, how am I doing for time? I got a little bit of time. Okay. Um, tiles. So um, of course you guys know about live tiles. Um, we have like a really sort of iconic start screen on Windows Phone. Um, and one of the things, another sort of tip for, for picking features for your application is users love live tiles and they love push notifications. Um, and what those are is, is um, um, live tiles obviously are you know updates to the tiles on your screen. I'll go back to here to show you on here. Um, so you, live tiles are you can see you know the people tile is, is is flipping around a little bit. If I had email set up on here, it would tell me how many unread messages I have. Um, so users love those, and they also love getting push notifications, which are toasts coming in, um, which is that little you get a little strip at the top giving you um, giving you information. So definitely integrating with those. Those are all available in 7. Definitely using those is, is, is a great idea. Um, what we've done in Mango to make those, to make those even easier to use um, is that we've, and actually I'll do this one on the emulator here. Um, here we go. So I have this little sample application here. And um, this is kind of the experience that you could get in um, in seven, so you have it's, it's you know it's been pinned to the start menu. You have your own custom tile. You can push down sort of an unread count, a little counter at the top. That's what that six is, and then you can also um, you know send send toast notifications um, like that one there. So that was all available in seven. What we've let you do in um, in Mango is it used to be you have to send those toasts from a web service. So you'd have to prop up a web service. Or the, to the tile updates. Um, you have to send those from a web service. You can now send them from, from your own application. So if you launch the application and you want to update that tile, 
Um, you can do that without having to, to prop up your own web servers. We've also, um, this launches, we've also, um, we've also uh, added support for multiple tiles per application. This is like a little fake news application. Um, and if I hit this classy little pin button, you can see I now have two tiles for the same application. Um, and sort of related to that is these, is the, oh, it, it spoiled my new feature. Okay. Um, I'll go to that one first. So we have backup tile support. So you can add, you can add a little bit more information to the back of your tile if you want. Um, it'll flip over like that. You can't control when it flips over, as you can see. Um, but it'll occasionally flip over and give you that information um, that, you, that you've either set from your application or that you've pushed down from the web service. Um, but back to, to secondary tiles. Uh, so you can add as many, as many other tiles as you want. You can see that the user gets taken back to the start screen each time you create a tile. Um, but the other nice thing you can do is you can have those tiles go to a different location in the app. So I have this tile um, set to go to the local news page instead of the main page. So you can deep link into your application from those tiles. Um, and you can also you know, pass parameters uh, in, in with, that, with that deep link. That's push and toast notifications. We've also added their, their music and photo extras, so you can build like a music app that gets a little bit integrated in with the Music Hub, as well as a photo app in Seven. We also added a search extra, um, so you can you can hook into the um, to the to the Bing search application for things like if you had an application that that was for uh, movie tickets or something like that, and someone searches for a movie, you could hook into that. Um, This may be something that Sean talked about last week too, maybe not, but we added a couple features that we brought over from Silverlight 4. So the original Windows Phone, uh, Windows Phone 7 was uh, more or less based on Silverlight 3, and Windows Phone Mango is more or less based on Silverlight 4. So you get some neat stuff, like you get the rich text box, which makes it a lot easier um, to provide you know, formatted text. Um, clipboard API, so now that Windows Phone has, a, has a copy and paste, you can now integrate that with your application. Performance improvements, um, uh, we use a fair bit less memory. Uh, we have generational garbage collection that actually came through up through NetCF. Um, and what, what that means is basically just garbage collection is a lot faster, um, which could be a big deal um, in games, for instance. You don't have these, these like jerky pauses when, when the game is trying to do garbage collection. Um, moved input to the render thread, so that was a little bit complicated. Um, there's a, there's a render thread, a UI thread, um, and then other potentially multiple threads um, running for a, for a Silverlight application. And what we've done is we, we, in, in 7, that input was on the UI thread, and potentially that could get blocked. If you were doing like a lot of animations or something like that, the UI thread um, wouldn't be very responsive. Um, so we've moved that to the render thread, so that just makes the touch experience in Silverlight a lot faster. Um, profiler, I may talk about tools a little bit later. Um, we've added a profiler to the developer tools. Uh, if you guys have never used a profiler before, I strongly recommend you try that. It'll be just like the first time you ever used a debugger. Um, it'll be like, this is, this is awesome. I can't believe I, I've never used this before. Um, so that's like a great way to really see the hot spots in your, where, you, where, you're, um, where your application is using a lot of memory or CPU time. International. So with Silverlight 4 comes a lot of, uh, uh, comes the support for, um, for all of the languages that we're shipping Mango in. So we're shipping Mango uh, phones, um, not just in North America and Europe, but also to, to East Asia. Um, so you have full support for, um, for right to left languages and, and, um, and Asian character sets. Um, tools, I'll go through this one pretty quickly. Because um, uh, the tools stuff is kind of supporting some of these new features, templates for multitasking. So right now, if you download the tools, you get some pretty good templates for building those background agents. Just get you started. Debugging background agents. Isolated Storage Explorer is actually not in the beta tools, um, so you won't see that there. Of course, the profiler. Um, I talked a little bit about the, the improvements to .NET. Um, taking advantage um, of the, uh, the SIMD unit on the... Uh, 
on the Snapdragon chips to make, uh, um, to make some math operations faster. I think that's what that's used for in, Net, in NetCF. Profiler twice, one, two, three times profiler. Um, emulator, so we added a bunch of new things to the emulator. Um, we support, we, add, we have some of, the, some of the sensors and location you can emulate um, in the emulator. I can actually show you that one quickly. So you meant, I think one of the guys up here mentioned, you know, what can I actually emulate in the emulator? So if I just do this, my screen's probably not big enough. Yeah, it doesn't like that because it's not big enough, I think. Oh, there it goes. So I can simulate the phone's orientation in space um, with the accelerometer. Um, I can also simulate the location. So I can set myself. To, and so if I, you know, if this application actually used location or accelerometer, it would be updating right now. Um, I actually don't have a demo for that. Um, but that's kind of handy, especially if you don't have a phone. Multi-touch in the emulator. So in, in 7, we supported multi-touch if you had a multi-touch monitor, if you were fortunate enough. Um, in, in Mango, um, you can do it with just, with just a mouse if you only have a single. I don't know if that feature is in the beta. Um, I don't think the next one is screenshot either, where you can take a screenshot of the, um, of the application in the emulator, and it'll be the right size for you. Um, as well as we're actually going to have sort of a pre-ingestion tool set um, uh, as part of, as part of uh, the tools that will allow you to sort of do a pre-check before you submit your, your, your application. So you won't end up with those cases like we saw earlier where it's like, hey, you could have told me that before I submitted. Well, now we will. Um, tips. So how much time do I have, Ben? Am I almost out of time? Uh, well, we have until 8.30, so we've got a little bit more time to go over. I'll cruise through these, and I'll open it up to questions. I was taking questions in the middle, so hopefully I got most of those. <laughs> Um, actually, there were some pretty good tips we heard earlier, um, but these are kind of my top six. It's Stefan and I kind of, it's another guy on my team came up with these. Um, and these, are, what, these are kind of the top things that we see um, as kind of switching gears a bit from new features. So actually, if there are any questions about new features, I can take a couple now. Go at the back. You mentioned something about game impacts earlier. Yeah. Um, I actually don't know, I can, I can, if you come up afterwards, I can get you some more info on that. I don't know too much about how that works. Yep. So I was playing with sockets a little bit, and I noticed that only um, asynchronous sockets were supported. Right. So there's no. Uh, so the question was around sockets and, and sort of what type of support there is. Um, in in Mango, there's no um, there's no uh, sort of bind to a port for a TCP, so you can't sort of create a, a server. Um, and you, can, you know, you kind of think that doesn't necessarily make sense on a phone either, because it's you know it's moving off the network, and your application may be getting tombstoned or navigated away. So we don't actually support that uh, on um, in Mango. Um, that's kind of what your question was. Anything else? Okay, I will move on to tips. So these are kind of the top things that we see, um, and we actually that that our our test team sees when they actually test applications. Um, these actually came from um, from some of the some of the partners that Microsoft works with pretty closely for building apps. You know, um, companies that are building some of the marquee apps for for the phone, um, like Facebook and Twitter, and just hundreds of apps that are sort of um, the real marquee applications where we sort of want to hold a higher bar of these being like really good Windows Phone apps. So, number one, the thing I mentioned earlier with that state model for navigation and tombstoning. Um, that's kind of the number one thing we see is, is developers not, not really handling that properly. So really think about um, what happens when at any time user, the user navigates away from my application. What, what kind of state do I need to save in order to come back into a decent place? What the user expects, and this all sort of stems from having a back key on the phone. What the user expects when they navigate forward to go check their email or something, then back into your application, they expect to be right where they left off. Um, and um, they'll be a little bit, little bit shocked if you, if you start you know, back at the beginning of, the, of your application, if you kind of relaunch your application. So what you need to do is you need to save all the information about the current state of your application into isolated storage, or there's a, um, there's a database of key value pairs that we also provide for some data. Um, and reserialize that when your application uh, comes back from tombstoning. Now, you don't need to do that 
if your application is just being suspended because your application won't know that it was suspended. It's just like a cut and it comes back and it's like nothing ever happened. Um, but if you do get that case where your application is tombstoned, you do have to handle that. Um, and that's when there's, you know, there's, tons, there's tons of guidance, again, on MSTN uh, for that. If you go to App Hub, um, we have a lot of tutorials and samples on that because it's, it's, it's something that we, we saw in a lot of applications. Handling different phone states, I think that was another one that was mentioned earlier. Make sure your, your application works when it's in airplane mode. Um, make sure it works when there's kind of bad data connections. Um, make sure it works when you're in light theme. That's a huge one. Actually, I can't overemphasize that enough. Um, test your app in light theme because you'll be surprised how ugly it is if you weren't thinking about that because you'll have your, color, your, colors, your colors will all be messed up. Memory usage. Um, your, uh, your application should run in less than 90 megabytes. We have a certification guideline uh, for that. If, you're, if there are cases where um, some phones potentially will not have um, that much memory available, so we have this requirement that your application will run um, in 90 megabytes of memory. If, if you're on a phone that has more free memory, you know, feel free to use that. Um, obviously, test your application. Test it before you submit it. Don't just test it as you go, because things change. Um, certification checklist I'll get to. I have another slide on that. And then, of course, monitoring your app. Use the performance tools, the profiler, uh, absolutely, to sort of find those hotspots um, in your application. Uh, certification, come on. There we go. So you're about to submit. Seven things to check before you submit. So no network problems. Like I said, make sure you work in airplane mode. Make sure you work if there's a, a 3G connection, a poor network connection. Um, you'd be surprised what can happen if, uh, you, if you're not thinking about it. Working less than 90 megabytes. Theme aware. Handles exceptions. So don't show exceptions to the user. Handle them and like, don't just show the stack trace. That's no good. No one knows what a stack trace is. Give a useful error. Back button works as expected. Um, there are some ways to override what the back button does. Don't do them unless you really know what you, what, what you, what you want to do and it makes the experience um, fit in with the phone. The back button, we have you know, a, a page model in Silverlight that um, generally speaking handles the back button as users, users expect. Um, but you can override that if you need to. We find people override it more than they need to. Um, so just be careful there. Consent and dialogue. So there's a whole bunch of certification requirements around push notifications and using location. Make sure you've just checklist and you've got all those. If you're using user's location, make sure you let them know and have the ability to turn off um, location tracking. Same thing with push notifications. There's, most of us here have unlimited or pretty good data plans, but um, whenever you're using the user's data, you really want to give them the option to not do that because um, they'll get upset if you, start, if, they start, if you start costing them money. Positive resume users music. This is an interesting one that doesn't actually affect everyone, but if you're doing, um, uh, if you have an application that uses music, there's some specific certification guidelines that you need to um, look at for doing that about how you, when you can pause the user's music, when you should keep it running, and when you should ask them um, if you want to pause or resume it. That's it. Um, more or less right on time. I got a couple minutes for questions. Um, anything at the back? So I stumbled into you minutes late because I went to the wrong building. But so, so I, you know, I know .NET pretty well. I know you know XNA pretty well. But apart from that, I'm a total newbie. Where should I go if I want to start, you know, learning how to write Windows? I would go to App Hub. Just go to. Here we go. There it is, yeah. And if I can just get my mouse over here. There we go. So go here, download the tools, and um, take a look at all this stuff. Developer training kits. These jump starts are really good. There's a ton of them. Optimizing for performance, that's a good one. Yep, yep. And if you're familiar with, you know, obviously if you're familiar with .NET on the desktop, it's going to be a fairly easy transition. 
Um, you know, the main things you got to watch out for is you're on a phone now. You don't have unlimited resources. Um, and sometimes people want to make phone calls. So your application can... can uh, almost a Mango training kit, too. I mean, sorry? we just did that. For, yeah. There, it takes uh, through all the features of Mango. Yeah, so I don't... Is that under... Um, I know there's some... Download the free tools. Yeah, so if you go into... The, yeah. Actually, another good one, if you go to the Mix website, there's tons of video sessions. That's where I pulled a lot of my slides from. Uh, if you go to the Mix website, folks on my team, there's probably a dozen sessions. They're all, they're all amazing. Um, it's just the download the free tools box yep. to the left. Oh, right. And then there are docs. Are tools. No, these are the seven tools. You want are the mango tools. Seven one where they were there. Oh, uh, I missed them? I'm not sure where that is, but there's uh, another good place for new mango stuff is, is this page, which has all the new changes uh, in the docs for mango. Socket support, network information, camera. Yeah, hands-on labs in that training kit. Yeah. Really hard. Probably if you search for that. What's it called? It's a, it's a mango training kit. Any other questions? Yeah. Like, that's the URL for this. Let's go back there. Does Mango support the Bluetooth? Sorry? Does Mango support Bluetooth? Bluetooth? Uh, no, there's no APIs for Bluetooth in Mango. It's the first link there. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Then you download it, and then it gives yep. you everything. It's nice. So you had a, a layer tile? Is that yeah. going to be enabled with Mango? Um, layer, you mean the app the application? Yeah. That was a demo that we showed at Mix. They um, they are building an application for Mango. Yeah. I, I see people are streaming out. Um, if you want to take some pizza for like a midnight snack, please do. If there's anything left over, it'll just be thrown away. Uh, so feel free to grab pizza on your way out. But we we have a few more minutes for Sean here. Yep. Any more questions over there. Uh, why the name Mango? Mango. Why the name Mango? Actually, that's a good one. Um, mangoes are sweeter than apples. Yeah, that's that's it. Um, <laughs> also ends in O. We have a history of code names ending in O. But yes, mangoes are sweeter than apples. Um, anything else? Yeah, at the front here. Sensors in the background. Um, some of them, yes. Um, things like the camera, you can't run in the background. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure which one exactly which ones run in the background. One touch to like to send an application to the phone. Yeah. So I mean, it's literally it's as easy as as hitting uh, this button right here. So if I had my phone hooked up, which I don't, I would go. Sorry, my laptop's a little slow. Oh, you guys can't see this. There we go. It is as easy as. There we go. So I'm going to the emulator. I can choose to go to the device. This isn't going to work because my device isn't hooked up. And then you just hit run and automatically deploy to the to your device. Now the one thing you have to do before you can deploy the device, you have to unlock your device. Um, so if, when you download the developer tools, um, there's a tool that comes with it called uh, I think it's called developer registration. And when you sign up at AppHub, I don't know if they have a process for yeah, students to sign you guys, up. You, if, if you don't have a, a developer account, uh, on the HiZap uh, website, there's registration instructions. Uh, interns are going to be able to go through the same process that employees go through. So you'll actually pay the $99 registration fee, but then there's a process by which you get refunded. And then once you have a registered developer account, you can develop or register or unlock three devices for uh, testing and debugging. And like Sean's saying, you have to do that before you can uh, deploy to your app from Visual, or sorry, to your phone from Visual Studio. So once you get set up for so App Hub, you go back to that website I was first on, register, do all your stuff, you'll get an account set up. Then you go plug in your phone, and you go into this application, put in your live ID and password, and click. Like this will change to uh, um, unlock or something. And after that's done, you can just deploy directly to your device from Visual Studio. 
super easy once you get it all hooked up. Question at the back, right, Shirt? Um, just a comment. Um, any student can get a free uh, developer's account. You don't necessarily need to go through the official learning account campus to do that. Yeah, but, we, but we're recommending that if you're going to do the contest, to go through the employee process because that'll ensure that you fill out the attestation form that you need to do so that you maintain ownership of your IP of your app for the contest. If you don't do the attestation, you could be in trouble uh, in terms of your IP ownership and was it moonlighting and was it clean? I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff, so it's the cleanest for you to go through the employee process. But you're right, uh, students, the DreamSpark program can't get a free app hub account. They only have the ability to unlock one device versus the three. And it's a, there's a little bit more validation that happens with students. It's still three. Huh? I've unlocked two already, so it's, it's got to be more than uh, one. They, they, they might have changed it. It was originally one to one instead of three. Get the good stuff. Microsoft's paying for it, for my recommendation. Uh, when you're using the Mango development tools, is there any sort of backwards compatibility? Yeah, so, uh, so what you can do is, you know, when you create a new project, uh, so it'll give you the option, you can select, um, it's like if you want to target uh, Windows Phone 7.0 or 7.1 um, when you create your project. Uh, you can also take a 7.0 project and upgrade it to 7.1. If you go into Project Properties, be a little drop down, you can change it from 7.0 to 7.1, and they'll do a little upgrade process, Ben. So a uh, question from folks online is, uh, do the, does the background transfer support authentication or, uh, and or HTTPS? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I, 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 so there, so uh, I suspect it supports anything you can do in the foreground, but I don't actually know if those things are supported in the foreground. So I don't know. How could somebody find out the answer? To so that? I would take a look at the uh, at the docs that page I was at before. If you go into here, uh, so see if it's in the docs that page I was at before had what's new. The other great resource uh, for folks that are here internally is join the WP DevD alias. So that's Windows Phone Developer Discussions. Um, and that's a, it's a super active alias. Um, just tons of people on that. Tons of traffic with like super really good. Inf active. Yeah, super, <laughs> super active. Well, I don't know. I've lost that page now. Um, but anyways, yeah, just fire away with questions there, and, and folks can can help you out. WP Dev D. D E V D. Any other questions at the front? Question. Why does like the mail app have white theme on it rather than? Uh, so you can see your emails. Emails come in often like HTML formatted, um, so it would look a little weird to be have white text and then black everywhere else. So you need to have that white for the HTML formatting. Cool. Thanks, guys. Have fun. <laughs>